Okay, folks, you're all set. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. You know, I, I actually feel a bit better now that we have this alarm system installed. You know what? Me too. I mean, it's not like there have been a lot of break-ins in the neighborhood, but I like the peace of mind. Yeah, for sure. Day one. Okay, uh, I'm on my way. Can you set the alarm when you go? Yep, we'll do. Day two. Day five. Uh, sorry, forgot to set the alarm. No problem. I'm sure it will be fine. Day ten. Did you set the alarm? Ah, no, didn't. You? Day 15. Day 227. Hey, I'm I'm home. What? What happened? They took everything. They took the TV. They took your laptop. The silverware's gone. It's oh, God. Like, I know. Oh, God. I can't. I can't believe it. Have you called the police? I'm, I'm calling them now. Did they take the hard drives? All our photos. Hopefully, nothing like this has ever happened to you. But maybe you can relate. You buy a home alarm system, or maybe a bike lock, or a security camera, and you use it religiously for a while. But then, over time, your house doesn't get broken into. Your bike doesn't get stolen. Your packages don't disappear from your porch. So you start to forget to set the alarm, or lock the bike, or turn on the camera. And there's a reason we do this. And it has to do with the way we perceive risk. Risk around everything from saving your work on a computer, to checking your phone while you're driving, to solo rock climbing. I'm Dr. Katie Milkman, and this is Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. It's a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. We bring you true stories involving high stakes, make or break moments, and we explore the latest research in behavioral science to help you make better choices and avoid costly mistakes. And when I open my eyes, I'm looking at the rope, just going straight to the ground with no backup knot. That's Jeff, describing a terrifying moment in his rock climbing career. More on that in a bit. My name is Jeff Ellison. I'm a 61-year-old psychology professor teaching at Adams State University in Southern Colorado. I've been climbing for 45 years. It's safe to say that Jeff knows a thing or two about rock climbing. I combine psychology and climbing in a book uh, that I co-authored, Vertical Mind. His home in Alamosa, Colorado, is a perfect spot for a climbing buff like Jeff, who pretty much loves everything about the sport. Being with great people, being out in the outdoors, beautiful settings. I mean, most of the cliffs where we go to are in just really, really nice areas. And the mental and physical challenges, uh, the mental challenges are unlimited. Uh, sometimes there's incredibly complex problem solving. If you're like me, the idea of scaling a rock cliff is terrifying. The risks involved in the sport are pretty apparent. Climbers may have to dodge tumbling rocks or can make mistakes like tying knots improperly. And of course, there's the risk of falling, something Jeff wasn't exactly comfortable with when he started climbing at the age of 16. It was part of what scared me uh, or made me hesitate in climbing. Now keep in mind, falls are generally controlled. Climbers are caught by their rope systems and climbing partners. An experienced climber like Jeff falls a lot. I fall hundreds of times a year. So over years of experience, Jeff became quite accustomed to falling. Uh, so these falls are relatively safe. The key word here is relatively. I think it is December 20th, 2018, and I just finished the semester. So uh, I was excited to have some time off, and the weather was amazing. We live at 7,500 feet in southern Colorado, where it's incredibly dry and sunny. 
So, uh, you know, the thermometer is reading like 15 degrees. I figured by the time I got to the cliff, it would be upper 20s or low 30s, which is just perfect uh, with the sun blasting these uh, cliffs that are fairly dark. Jeff's usual climbing crew wasn't available on this particular day, but he was determined to push towards his goal of climbing 100 days that year. He was almost there. It would be his 94th day of climbing. I texted several different partners and none of them were available. So I started to consider this idea of rope soloing. And when I got the you know last no, I'm, I'm not available, I decided, well, that's what I'm going to do. It didn't occur to me to go back and let any of those people know that I was going to go out rope soloing. And I failed to mention that to my wife as well. <laughs> not ideal, but he planned to go to a familiar area. And he had done some solo climbing before, even if he did prefer climbing with friends. It was a beautiful day out. After a warm-up climb near a town called Del Norte, Jeff drove to the second climbing location of the day, an area with challenging overhanging cliffs. An area called English Valley. It doesn't have very many climbs, but it's, it's taller. I think most of the climbs there are about 75 feet. It's quite a bit harder. Just beautiful morning, it was warming up. Uh, gorgeous views of 13,000, 14,000 foot peaks. It's high desert, cactus all around. He got to work setting up his top rope system. Jeff used something called a stick clip, a long extendable pole that lifts his rope up ahead of him. He used the stick clip to attach the rope to the anchor, which was already installed. So what this means is that the rope is anchored at the top of the cliff. You know, it could be on a tree or something like that. In this case, it's on a pair of anchor bolts that are good for thousands of pounds of force. And then from the ground, you attach an auto belay device. So an auto belay device is kind of like a ratchet wrench. It slides up the rope, but if you pull down on it or if you fall, it'll lock, uh, supposedly. (laughs) That's the idea anyway. And typically people take extra safety precautions. Sometimes they'll actually be attached to two separate strands of rope with two or more auto belays. You can tie backup knots as you climb. So if the thing would not lock up, Uh, You would slide down the rope until you hit your backup knot, and then hopefully that would stop you. The recommended system for this type of climbing is at least two auto-locking belay devices. Jeff chose to set up one auto-locking device and tie a backup knot. I wasn't going with a recommended system, only having one auto-locking device. I mean, having a bunch of devices is inconvenient. It can interrupt the flow. Uh, It can make it just so much harder that the climb becomes impossible. So he got going on his second climb of the day, one that was a bit less familiar. It also had a pretty tricky crux, what climbers refer to as the hardest sequence of climbing. The crux can range from just a few feet to a much longer section. I'd only done it about six times before, and I knew the crux was kind of tricky. I didn't remember it exactly, but I I kind of knew the gist of uh, what you needed to look for. But I couldn't find the key foothold because it's so small. I mean, like the size of a penny, basically. And I thought maybe it had broken off, so I just decided to go for it. And I fell. The auto lock didn't lock right away. I slipped maybe 12 or 18 inches, and that got my attention. I thought, damn, that's not supposed to happen. That's disappointing. And I got my heart racing a little bit. And uh, maybe I should have called it a day right then, but I was stubborn. Uh, So I I finished the climb with that incident and uh, came down and, and rested for a while. Despite the scare that his system didn't catch him right away, Jeff got back on the cliff for the final laps of the day. So I rested a little bit and started up the next one, and and I knew it really well. And I got about halfway up past the initial section to where there's one rest and I could tie a backup knot. So at that point, I'm reassessing, thinking, well, I'm feeling kind of tired. Maybe I should just call it a day after I finish this one. So I'm hanging by these two big handholds, uh, but again, it's overhanging. You know, you can't let go with both hands at the same time. So it's pretty strenuous and looking up, trying to see how I've got the ropes rigged. Like, you know, can I just finish one climb and pack up all my gear and, and get out of here? And I decided, yes, I can do that. And I just dropped my head for a second to close my eyes and relax just one more time. And when I open my eyes, I'm looking at the rope, just going straight to the ground with no backup knot. At this point, the ground is 35 feet below Jeff. Rope dangling between his legs, 
No backup knot in case his system were to fail. An essential step he forgot to do until that moment. And that kind of gave me a jolt of adrenaline. I thought, oh, that would have been bad. So I tied the backup knot, launched into the first hard section, and just fell right off. And the rope caught right away, and I I was fine. Um, So I get back on, and I climb the rest of the way. And I was having trouble resting where I normally would. I think I laughed out loud at one point, like, holy cow, like, I am wrecked. It's time to go home. And the final rest was only about seven feet from the anchor. But he kept going, choosing to push through the challenging but familiar climb. I've done this a bunch of times, and it's a, it's a tricky climb in that the intuitive thing to do is to grab the handholds, you know, whatever it is, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, right hand. But that leaves you in a dead end. You, you can't do the final move to the anchor. So there's a trick, you know, when you want to grab right hand at one point, you've got to grab left hand instead. I think I was just so focused on calling it a day that I let that slip my mind and I climbed myself into a dead end just two feet from the anchor. And I I decided, well, it's not good style, but I can pretty much just jump and and grab the slings at the anchor. And I did that and my foot slipped and that's when I fell. I just expected that I would stop right away and it didn't catch. So I thought, oh, it's not catching again. And after I slid, I don't know, four or five feet, I realized, oh, it's really not catching. Like, is it going to catch? Jeff's auto belay device didn't catch him. And then I grabbed the rope. Visually, all I can remember is just like staring at my hands and the rope above me and the anchor receding away from me as I raced toward the ground. I had time to think that, you know, my skin's burning up. This really hurts. Even the thought that this might be permanent damage to my tendons. And I thought, you know, I'm going to keep holding on. Maybe I'll just shatter my legs. And then I can't believe it's going to end this way. You know, meaning my life, of course. I just screamed, no! No! with this mixture of fear, anger, and denial. And then all of a sudden, boom, I come to this bouncing stop. And it took me a second, and I I thought I must have hit the backup knot. I quickly uh, looked at the gear and said, yep, for sure, this is the backup knot, the auto belays jammed into it, you know, the knot is good, I'm not gonna die today. As Jeff dangled midair, about 45 feet down from where he fell, he inspected his hands. They were shredded from gripping the rope as it raced through his palms. His skin was torn down to the muscle on some fingers, and others were just covered in massive blisters. And nobody was there to help him get back down to the ground or to provide first aid. This particular cliff is off a dirt spur road, off a more major dirt road. Uh, Probably one or two cars per day drive that maybe not even that uh, in winter. So, you know, I couldn't expect somebody just to come by. There were no houses in sight. Uh, My cell phone was down in my pack on the ground. So, you know, I was going to have to get myself out of this situation, basically what we would call a self-rescue. Because of the way I'd rigged the ropes, there was a second strand of rope hanging fairly close to me. And I was just barely able to kick it with my toes and get it swinging. And I grabbed it and I pulled it over to myself. And I tied a loop in that second strand of rope at about chest height and inverted, put my foot in it, and then hauled myself up with my hands, uh, which was quite painful. And because of rope stretch, I only gained about a foot. But at that point, I was able to get some slack in the rope and, and inch the auto belay device up, which then locked. So I gained, you know, one or two feet toward the anchor. After 45 minutes of completing that painful process over a dozen times, Jeff got to the anchor, so he could safely rappel down the cliff and collect his gear along the way. Got to the ground, just, I've never been so happy to touch the ground (laughs) as I was at that moment. And uh, even though my hands were screaming, I I, I pulled the ropes, packed the ropes, packed my backpack, and, you know, did the five-minute hike to my truck, threw all my gear in there, just elated, and uh, drove back out. The drive to a local medical center was nearly an hour long. The staff there took a look at his hands. So my hands were pretty black, 
Um, they were also covered in gymnastics chalk that we used to keep our hands dry. And then there was the blood news and everything. So it was pretty hard to tell what was going on. The staff sent him to an emergency room a short drive away. And I, I picked up my wife on the way from work. I, I called her and started the conversation with, uh, honey, I'm absolutely 100% fine. Uh, but uh, I did have kind of a big fall and my hands were kind of torn up, you know, tried to give her the good news first. They took a look at my hands and they had me clean them further and, and soak them a bit. And where my finger had been sort of welded down, uh, finally loosened up and I was able to straighten it. They bandaged me up. I, I just looked like I had mittens on. You couldn't see anything on my hands. And uh, my wife drove me home. Thankfully, Jeff didn't need surgery, and his injuries didn't result in long-term damage. Reflecting on it, there's a lot Jeff could have done differently to reduce the risks of climbing alone. You know, I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing there, maybe pushing as hard as I, I was or not resting more. But even the way I, I did the rope soloing, I mean, that's not the recommended method. Sometimes people will have two strands of rope and four auto belays and, you know, even a fifth and a sixth backup. So what I was doing was fairly sketchy and, you know, I had justified it in a number of ways. Uh, you know, I, I'd done it before, it had caught before, I was unlikely to fall. Um, I've got a backup knot. So, I, you know, I justified doing something that was uh, not at all recommended. It was riskier uh, than it should have been. He's not entirely sure why his device didn't catch him that day. But it's not a setup he plans to use again. And there's still days where I don't have a partner and I haven't climbed for three days. And it's really tempting to go do that again. But I promised my wife I wouldn't. I would never solo with a single auto belay device again. So I have learned a little bit over the years. <laughs> Jeff Ellison is an avid rock climber and psychology professor at Adams State University. He's also the co-author of Vertical Mind, Psychological Approaches for Optimal Rock Climbing. You can find a link to his book in the show notes and at schwab.com slash podcast. When Jeff began climbing as a teenager, he was very concerned about falling, even in a controlled setting. That initial fear was based on his perception of the risks involved in the sport, but not on his experience. But over time, and through experience, his fear diminished, perhaps a bit too much. Often, when a person has experienced situations involving a certain kind of risk and gotten by unscathed, they lean heavily on that, and they underestimate the likelihood that a rare bad outcome will arise in the future. In this case, Jeff was climbing a familiar route, felt confident he wouldn't fall, and underestimated the risk that his auto-locking belay device would fail. There are many ways to explain Jeff's risky decision to climb alone and with only one auto-locking device. For example, overconfidence, or an excessive desire to reach his round number goal of climbing on 100 days in 2018. But I want to focus on another feature of the way humans perceive risk that might help explain his decision. It's called the description experience gap in risky choice. My next guest, Professor Ido Erev, identified this behavioral phenomenon in research with his collaborator, Ralph Hertwig. Ido joined me from his home in Haifa, Israel. Hi, Ido. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure. You know, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is if you could just explain the experience description gap in risky choice. What is it exactly? Yes, when people face a new choice task and have to decide based on uh, the description of this choice task, they often behave as if they uh, exhibit high sensitivity to low probability risk. However, when they gain experience, often they, they exhibit the opposite pattern and start behaving as if they believe that it won't happen to me. Uh, for example... When I bought my first new car in the 90s, I was told that I can protect myself against uh, car burglary if I spend another $50 on a car radio with a detachable panel. And I thought this is a good idea. I paid another $50 and uh, was happy with my choice. But after a week, I stopped detaching the panel. So initially, when I was told about the risk of uh, radio burglary, I was really concerned and I decided to pay the money, but after a week, I really, I started behaving as if it won't happen to me and I stopped detaching the panel. 
That's really interesting and reminds me of the way a lot of my friends who live in the city where I live talk about the fancy house alarms that they have installed that at the beginning when they get it installed, it seems like a great idea and there's this risk someone will break in and they, uh, you know, alarm their house every time they leave for like a week. And then after that, they're like, no one's broken into my house. This isn't going to happen. So that's really, really interesting. Exactly. Um, I also have an alarm like that too. (laughs) Right. A a very useful for one week alarm. Um, Could you describe some of your research showing that people make these different decisions when they face a described versus an experienced risk? Yeah. The, our typical lab experiments include many trials. And in each trial, as a participant is asked to choose between a safe and a risky option. In one example, the safe option always is a status quo. Basically, if you select this option, you are told if you select it, you're going to get a zero for sure. The other option is a risky prospect. In this particular example, it's lead to a loss of 10 shekels, which is about $3 in 10% of the trials, and to again of one shekel in the other trials. So in 90% of the time, it's actually pay one shekel. Okay, so participants can choose a risky option involving a one shekel gain with a probability of 90%, but a 10% chance of losing 10 shekels. They could also choose a risk-free status quo option that involves no chance to earn money, but also no chance of losing any. And I seem to recall that they find out after each decision exactly what payoff they've earned so they can learn from experience. Exactly. Before they get feedback, in the very first trial, most subjects tend to avoid the risk. They don't want the risk of losing 10 and they go for the status quo. But after one of two trials with feedback, most of them move and select the risky prospect. Importantly, this is happening even if Uh, despite the fact that in this experiment and many other experiments, choosing the risky prospect actually uh, lead to a loss on average, and they could go with a status quo and get zero for sure. So why is it that people are doing that? What what do you think it is that's driving people to have this different reaction to the described risk initially than to the experienced risk after they've gone through these trials? I think that people always try to select the option that led to the best outcome in similar situation in the past. This effort is effective because often what works in the past is likely to work now too, but can lead to two biases. One bias that you might recall a past experience that only looks similar and in fact are not similar to the current situation. This bias is particularly important when you make the first decision from description because you're not sure, you're still not familiar with the new choice task and you might overgeneralize from other situations. The second bias is because we tend to think about the most similar past experience, we're going to rely on a small sample of past experience. And when you rely on small sample, then in most cases, you don't think about the rare outcome, the low probability outcome. For example, a few years ago, I received high fine when I uh, touched my smartphone while driving near my, the, the, my university gate. Mm. Now I tend to think, if I want to touch my my smartphone when I approach the gate, now I think again, I say, hey, this is dangerous. But I only do that when I'm near this gate. And in other situations, I often do touch my smartphone uh, screen. So I uh, this experience of getting this high fine uh, affects my behavior, but only in similar situations. Most, uh, and most natural, uh, most of the decision problems are not similar to these rare cases because the rare cases are rare. That's really interesting. Does the order in which people encounter a description of a risk versus having experience with a situation that involves risk matter at all? Well, when subjects get both description and experience, and we have we run many experiments of that sort, uh, the impact of experience is much stronger than the impact of description. So in a typical experience, when you give subject description and now they make several decisions, in the first decision, they are sensitive to the description. The second decision, they are also sensitive a little bit. But by the third decision, they are more likely to behave as if they're underweight rare event than overweighting rare event. It's amazing that people only need to have a couple of experiences with taking a risk and having a good outcome before they get quite comfortable taking that risk again. So we very quickly moved to sort of forming some kind of statistical model in our heads with data that was described to forming one with our experience. Yeah. One explanation for that is that we have so much experience in real life with descriptions that are inaccurate. So when you hear description, if this is the only information you have, then you consider it. But after you get experiences, you feel, basically we feel that we can do better by relying on our personal experience and on that description that may be incorrect. That's fascinating. 
I, I have spent a lot of time in the last year, I will admit, thinking about how your research relates to the behavior we're observing in the current COVID-19 pandemic. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about that. And specifically, my sense is that people back in March of 2020, when this threat was primarily one, if you're living outside of China, that people were hearing about described but hadn't yet really experienced, that people made pretty cautious decisions. And then, you know, obviously with some exceptions, but then later in the pandemic, after many months of experience with its risks, we saw people behaving differently. And I'm curious if you feel like that's related to your work in the way that I've I've perceived it to be. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. And I think the description and experience gap had contributed and still contributing to the spread of COVID-19. Specifically the fact that policymakers thought that if they will just warn people and tell them about, uh, you know, I heard in the news about the old man uh, dying in the street in China, that people will be panicked and will be very, very careful. And in fact, many people were careful. So policymakers in the West saw that it will be enough to, to warn people about the risk and then things will be okay. So I also plan to be careful. For example, uh, when I just heard the news and people were asked to stay at home, I told my mother, who was, who was now 93, I told her uh, that she should not leave home and I will uh, go shopping for her and will leave her the products outside her door. And uh, then we talk by phone. So I did it one week. And then in the second week, my mother said, you know, uh, I just heard in the news, it's only dangerous for people over 80. I'm over 90. Maybe we can talk. Then we said, well, we sit outside. We sit outside first week with a mask. Second week, she said, oh, I don't hear you well with a mask. So we take off the mask and then it was raining and then we move inside. So I think I'm not the only one who initially planned to be very careful, but is less careful now. I think that as this difficulty that I presented suggests that it's not enough to describe the risk to people, but it is necessary to enforce socially responsible behavior. And the interesting question, how do you enforce socially uh, responsible behavior? Of course, you can use a Chinese way, which is, uh, as we know, extremely effective, but it's less likely to, to be successful in the West because privacy is more important than other things. We, we just talked a bit about the pandemic. I'm curious because there are so many walks of life where we face risks that are initially described and then experienced. I'm curious if there's other examples that you think are important to policymakers or that you've observed over your career where you think this particular bias looms large? Yeah, well, the, the short summary of all this research that if policymaker wants people to do socially desirable behavior, it's not enough just that this behavior will be beneficial on average. It also has to be beneficial most of the time. Because if people rely on small sample, then if you get prize for doing the right thing with small probability, most of the time you will not think about the prize. And if you get uh, punishment with small probability, you will not think about the punishment most of the time. We have to make sure that the socially desirable thing is beneficial on average. This is a good first step, but it's not enough. We also want to make sure that the socially desirable behavior is better most of the time. Because if people rely on small samples, they are highly sensitive to the most frequent experience. It's really interesting. And it suggests uh, when we have policies like giving speeding tickets or giving tickets for texting and driving or, you know, fining people if they aren't wearing their mask, that you don't want a really large fine with low probability. You want a small fine with high probability. Is that a reasonable way to think about it? Exactly. My last question is just a really practical one. I'm wondering how you would advise our listeners to try to make better decisions in their own lives in the face of risk now that they're familiar with this work you've done. Well, I think the most important thing, I think, is in in designing your career. So basically, it's a good thing, and I'm thinking about it when I talk with my daughters, that, uh, you know, it's good to think, it's important to have long shot goals. This keeps you uh, waking up in the morning. But when you think about different career paths to reach your goals, it's a good idea to take paths that will be fun in most days to reduce the risks that you give up too early. So if you have some long shot goal that in order to, to do that, you're going to suffer most day until you reach there, there is high probability you give up too early. For example, think about uh, young people who want to start a startup firm or start working for a startup firm. So my idea that 
this is a good idea only if you think so the startup firm in theory can help create a better world and make you rich so this is a very nice goal that you should pursue but you will only do it and the probability of success really depend if every day that you come to work you enjoy it and also that you will learn something new every day or most days that will help you even if the startup firm is unsuccessful so the idea you want to have a long shot goal a nice goal but you also want to make sure that in most days you you're having fun because otherwise you might give up too early. I love the lesson and it's wonderful because we did an episode with Ayala at Fishbach and Dan Ariely last year where we focused on the importance of making it fun because of people's tendency to overweight immediate rewards relative to distant goals. And I love, I love how this all ties back together with the experience description gap and risky choice. So that's a wonderful final lesson. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. I really, really appreciate it. This was just fascinating. I learned so much. Thank you. It was fun. Edo Arev is a psychologist, professor, and vice dean of the MBA program at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. You can find links to his work in the show notes and at schwab.com slash podcast. It's one thing to have the risks of trading stocks described to you, but as we've learned, that often isn't effective. Experience matters more. But even then, if you don't experience the occasional losing investment, you can lose sight of the risk inherent in trading. A recent episode of the Financial Decoder podcast called How Can You Manage Your Emotions While Trading discusses those risks, including techniques that can mitigate them and help keep emotional biases from undermining your trading plan. Have a listen at schwab.com slash financial decoder or wherever you get your podcasts. Remember how Ido Erev talked about buying a detachable car radio because he worried that his radio would be stolen and wanted to be able to take it with him whenever he parked? And how over time he grew less inclined to go through the hassle of actually detaching the radio and taking it with him? Well, eventually, his radio was stolen. Not once, but twice. Back in the day, radios were easily removable from cars. People would buy them with detachable faceplates to render them useless to thieves. Fortunately, car companies now mostly produce vehicles with sound systems that can't be removed. Consumers don't have to worry about their radios being stolen, or have to deal with lugging them around when they park their cars. You may remember from a past episode of Choiceology that making the best choice the easiest choice, making it the default, often leads to better outcomes. That strategy also works well for limiting the impact of the description experience gap in risky choice. Let me give you another example where setting a default can help mitigate risk. Maybe you can think of a time when you were working on a school paper or a project for work. Initially, you might have been very careful to regularly save your work because you perceived the risk of the software crashing or computer freezing to be high. Then, after working away without incident for many hours, you saved less frequently. And then, the worst happened. Say a power outage, and you lost hours of work. This is why many software applications now save your work by default, rather than waiting for you to manually save. And while Ido talked about the fact that people underweight rare risks when making decisions from experience, his research shows that people also underweight rare opportunities. There are many situations where people start working to achieve a certain goal, but if the experience they have early on as they pursue the goal is difficult, they may give up too quickly. Ido points to the value of making goal pursuit fun, the topic of another Choiceology episode, to ensure that the day-to-day -day experience is positive enough that you won't give up too early and miss out on a rare but valuable opportunity. You've been listening to Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. If you've enjoyed the show, we'd be really grateful if you'd leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. You can also subscribe for free in your favorite podcasting app. And if you want more of the kinds of insights we bring you on Choiceology about how to improve your decisions, you can pre-order my forthcoming book, How to Change, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Or sign up for my monthly newsletter, Milkman Delivers, at katymilkman.com newsletter. 
Next time, you'll hear how spies use memory techniques to avoid detection. And I'll speak with two of my friends and collaborators, Todd Rogers and Angela Duckworth, about the issue of forgetting and the importance of timing when it comes to reminders. I'm Dr. Katie Milkman. Talk to you soon. For important disclosures, see the show notes or visit schwab.com slash podcast.